my brothers and my sisters, today we celebrate Palm Sunday. If we were back physically worshiping in our sanctuary this morning, we would have given you a piece of a palm leaf which symbolized and commemorated Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem the Sunday before he was crucified. On this Palm Sunday. We want to examine some of the positions taken by the people who made up the crowd that followed Jesus as he entered Jerusalem on the day that we celebrate as Palm Sunday. It is my prayer that on this Palm Sunday that we will choose the correct position to take in our worship and our service to God. When we look at the backdrop that our selected scriptural text is set in, Jesus has less than a week to live and he knows it fully well. He has finally decided to make it known publicly that he is the long awaited Messiah, the king that God's people Israel has been waiting for for hundreds of years. The prophet Zechariah prophesied over 400 years earlier in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. He prophesied, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The time had finally come when Jesus was ready to bring this prophecy to fulfillment. Verses 1, 2, and 3 of Mark's gospel tells us as Jesus approached Bethphage, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives that Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, 
you will find a coat tied there which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. Now, here, my brothers and sisters, is the first opportunity for a wrong position to be taken. What are you talking about, Pastor? Suppose you had been there as one of Jesus' 12 disciples. And what if Jesus did not choose you for the donkey assignment? <laughs> Would you have taken a negative position would you have caught a negative attitude and became envious over the fact that Jesus decided to send to others and not you? Would you have thought or said to yourself, why do these two disciples get to be the ones that go on this assignment? Why didn't Jesus choose me? I am just as qualified as they are. My brothers, and sisters, fewer things are as damaging to the body of Christ than folk taking the position that I should have gotten that assignment or I should have gotten that opportunity or I should have gotten that position. Am I right about it? The attitude of envy sometimes causes us as Christians to say things about other Christians that should never be said. We question their motives their hearts, and their intentions. We forget that we are called the body of Christ and not the interchangeable parts of Christ. Listen to me good. I have heard countless times throughout my pastoral ministry that Pastor Wood, you have to treat everybody the same. But you know what I have discovered? I discovered that even Jesus, our Lord and Savior, does not treat us the same because he has different roles and different ministries for each of us to fulfill. 
Some of us, if we would have been there when Jesus chose the two, would have said, if Jesus was going to give the privilege of going to the two, then he should have done it for the twelve. <laughs> That's the only way Jesus could be fair. And sometimes we get upset with others over God's call on their lives. But we do not understand what price they have paid to get where they are. Sometimes God cannot use some of us in the spotlight because we're unwilling to pay the price to get to the spotlight. Lord have mercy. Can I take my time? Now, verse 4 of the Mark text tells us they went, talking about the two disciples, went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. The Bible says they went <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, one of the reasons why Jesus selected these two particular disciples for this assignment was because Jesus knew that they would choose to take the right position of total obedience to his word. Let me say that again. Maybe Jesus chose these two disciples because he knew that these two disciples would take the right position of total obedience to his word. Check this out. When Jesus tells them to go and get the colt, Jesus does not mention anything about money or about payment. Check the text out. He just tells them to untie the coat and bring it to him. Now, come on, come on, let's be honest. If Jesus would have given some of us these same instructions, we would have said, wait a minute, Jesus. You want me to do what? You want me to untie somebody else's coat? Come on, Jesus. You know that people are mean. And if they see me untying their coat, they might try to fight me. Or Jesus, they might have a gun and try to shoot me. Come on, Jesus. At least give me a note. <laughs> At least give me some money just in case things go bad. Know this with me. That these two disciples did not question 
or deliberate on the assignment that Jesus gave to them. They simply took Jesus at his word and obeyed his directive. So, I got a question to ask. What position do you take when God calls you to do something but does not give you anything to accomplish it with except his word. In other words, is God's word good enough for you to solely stand upon? Listen to me good. God cannot choose some of us because he knows that we will not go through with the task that he has assigned to us. God knows, he knows, he knows that we don't possess the faith that is necessary to accomplish the assignment. So, he chooses others who has the faith and the capacity to believe and to obey him. Well, the Bible says that when the two disciples began untying the coat. Some people standing there ask, what are you doing untying that coat? The two disciples answered as Jesus told them to. And the Bible says, that the people let them go. <laughs> now, know this with me, that as soon as the people heard the words, the Lord needs it. They were eager to let it go. And according to Matthew's gospel, not only did the owners send the coat, they sent also along the coat's mother. In other words, the owners decided to take the position of generosity in their giving unto the Lord. <laughs> they gave wholeheartedly unto the Lord. They did not take the position that they were just going to give Jesus the coal. But they determined to give Jesus more. How about you? How about those of you who are listening and watching today? What is your position when it comes to giving to the Lord? Is your position negative or positive? Does your position towards giving hinder others 
who want to give more unto the work of the Lord. Let me move on. When the two disciples returned with the coal and the donkey, verse 7 of our Mark text tells us that when they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. As Jesus, his disciples, and a great multiple multitude of people began to process into Jerusalem, Verse 8 tells us that many of the people in the crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the field. My brothers and sisters, let me suggest to you that here we see two positions that were being manifested among the people who made up this Palm Sunday procession. The first possession, position, excuse me, chosen by some of the people was that they wanted to immediately offer Jesus the best that they had. Let me say that again. The first position chosen by some of the people was that they wanted to immediately offer Jesus the best that they had. The Bible says that some of the crowd took off their coats and clothing and began to lay it down on the road to form a royal carpet for the animals bearing Jesus to walk on. These people were not concerned that their clothes might get torn or not be reusable. They were not concerned about getting their garments back. Their focus was on going all out to honor Jesus Christ. And this Palm Sunday morning, is this the position that you take when it comes to serving and honoring God. Can you say, Lord, you can count on me to give whatever I have for your glory and your honor. Lord, I am willing to give you the best of my service, the best of my resources, and even the best of my time. The first position that we see demonstrated as Jesus 
entered in Jerusalem is the position of those who wanted to immediately offer Jesus the best that they had. And I don't know how you feel about it. But to me, God deserves the best. He deserves my best. He deserves the best of my service, the best of my worship, the best of my devotion, the best of my gifts, the best of my time. Why does he deserve the best? Because he gave his very best for us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Then there was another group who took another position present on that Palm Sunday day. This second group was made up of those who took the position that we are willing to sacrifice for Jesus something good, even if it's not the best that we can give. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> These were the folk in the crowd who kept their coats <laughs> and kept their garments on. But they were willing at least to go and cut down the palm branches and lay them down as a means of honoring and respecting Jesus. They are in the crowd and want to participate, but they just did not want to participate wholeheartedly. And my brothers and my sisters, this is the position that many Christians take today. They are doing some good and somewhat investing themselves in the work of the kingdom of God. But they haven't decided that all that they truly are belongs to God. They are still not convinced that doing things God's way is the best way to handle their lives. They try to measure their level of goodness by looking at what other folk are doing. Listen, listen, listen to me good. God does not want our good. God wants our best. Anything less than our best is unacceptable unto God. Well, as I prepare to close this message, I have shared with you today several positions that were taken or demonstrated amongst the crowd on the Sunday known today as Palm Sunday. I shared with you 
that 10 of the disciples of Jesus could have shown and have taken the position of being envious for not being selected to go and get the coat that Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on. I also suggested that maybe Jesus selected the two disciples because he knew that they would take the right position of total obedience to his word. I also shared with you that the owners of the coat took the generous position of giving unto the Lord not just the coat, but also for its mother too. And then when the triumphal entry into Jerusalem began, we saw two positions taken by the people who made up the procession. We saw some who took the position of wanting to immediately offer to Jesus the best that they had while others decided to give Jesus something good even though it was not their best. Well, the Bible says that as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, that the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. The Bible says they began to shout Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. To harmonize scripture with scripture. In Luke's gospel, chapter 19 and verse 39, Luke tells us that some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, you hear them screaming, Hosanna. Rebuke your disciples. Tell them to be quiet. And Jesus says, I tell you, if they Keep quiet. The stones will cry out. And as I prepare to close out this message, there was one more part of the crowd on that Palm Sunday that should be noted. This crowd chose to take a negative position concerning Jesus and his wonder working power. This crowd was made up of those who took the position that Jesus did not deserve to be praised. Check out 
who it was that took this position. Luke tells us some of the Pharisees. Now come on, New Providence. You know who the Pharisees were, don't you? They were the religious leaders of that day. Why, Pastor Wood, did the religious leadership take the position that Jesus did not deserve to be praised? What, Pastor Wood, did these religious leaders stand to lose? I'm glad you asked. They stood to lose authority with the Romans. They stood to lose authority over the people. The religious leaders knew that the words that the people were shouting were only supposed to apply to the Messiah, the Son of God. So they decided that Jesus did not deserve to be praised. There <laughs> were some of the religious leaders who chose to take the position that Jesus was not worthy to be praised. But New Providence Missionary Baptist Church and to the friends of New Providence who are watching and listening this morning, let me, as your religious leader, declare to you today that I will I will not, I cannot ever take the position that Jesus is not worthy to be praised. Why, Pastor Wood? Because he has done so much, so much for me. What has he done? He saved me when I was lost. Woke me up this morning with a reasonable portion of the health and strength. He healed me when I was sick. He provided, protected, and shielded me from the fiery darts of the wicked. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah, hallelujah. He's been too good for me to deny him and not praise his holy name. Come on, where you, you're watching from, open up your mouth and give him a shout of praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. So the question, the question, is what position will you take concerning Jesus the Christ on this 